Welcome to Before Showtime with Connor Marcello. This is Connor speaking. And this is Marcello speaking. And today on this episode of Before Showtime, we have a special guest with us named Lucas. Welcome to the showtime, Lucas. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Do you want to give the audience a little bit of a background as to your interest into movies and why today might be a good episode for you to hop on? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've always uh, loved movies, but I, I think I really honestly, seriously started kind of like an active practice of like studying and looking into certain directors a couple of years ago when I lived near a, a video rental store and I made friends with, you know, the, propri the proprietor of that place uh, who was just like an encyclopedia of knowledge, helped me kind of orient myself towards things that I might be into. Like I would just walk in and say, oh, you know, give me five like 90s movies just because I'd seen like one 90s movie that was like corny and wonderful. And, you know, he'd recommend things like Muriel's Wedding, which is still one of my favorites wow. to this day, uh, like Red Rock West with Nicolas Cage. So yeah. um, just that like movie going experience was fairly recent for me. And um, just in my, uh, uh, I studied film a little bit. So like I, I just finished a master's program here in DC where I uh, wrote a thesis about body switching movies, um, family, wow comedies american comedies like honey i shrunk the kids um big 13 going on 30 those sorts of things and um yeah it's been really fun and uh i just yeah, and i also about like kind of on a side note i just want to congratulate you for uh you know graduating a master's program it's an incredible uh, achievement so oh, thanks so continue, much yeah yeah continue the hard work you're doing an awesome job today's Thank episode you. What we are going to be doing is reviewing two Criterion movies. And this type of episode, we are going to title it The Criterion Carousel. So essentially today, me and Connor picked a movie and Lucas picked a movie. But first, we're going to start with Lucas's pick, which is... Lucas, do you want to introduce the audience to what you picked for us to watch? Absolutely. So I picked uh, the 1997 film titled Funny Games, directed by Michael Haneke. Um, and I guess a very brief synopsis, it's about a, a family, uh, a mother, a father, and their young son who go on a vacation to their lake house. Um, and they are approached by a strange, uh, a strange young man uh, in a tennis outfit, all white. Strange, strange is an understatement, everyone. This young man has serious psychological issues. Yeah. So one man, uh, it ends up being he has a friend. He brings a friend along with him. They've got the shortest white shorts you've made me ever seen. Um, and all they want, seemingly, are just a couple of eggs to bring to the the neighbors who are also the family's friends the main family they their neighbors at this uh uh this like you know this area of lake houses and cottages um they're introduced to the, uh these men uh it, it seems as though like oh these are you know like friends of ours is like a a friend like a friend's nephew or something very strange connection yeah, right. um and yeah, yeah, and the reason why too, yeah, and why it gets out of control too is because these two young men that are berating this family are playing games with them, hence the title Funny Games. But just to warn the audience, this is not a funny movie at all whatsoever. No, Connor, what what no. were your thoughts? You can go deep dive spoiler all you want. Like, what did you think of this movie, Connor? Yeah, this movie was something. It's, first of all, like, if you don't want to see, like, violent, disturbing imagery, don't watch this. Because this is a pretty chilling psychological thriller. I had actually seen one uh, Mikhail Hanukkah film before that. And that was The Piano Teacher with Isabel Huppert, which... Love that movie. Honesty, might not have been the ideal way to start, but it's it's still a brilliant movie with one of the best performances I think I've ever seen from an actor. I mean, this oh, yeah. time around he gets them again because I have to I have to give a special shout out to this actress. Her name is Suzanne Lothar. 
or Suthan Lothar. Sorry if I mispronounced it. She oh, yeah. was absolutely excellent in this movie, portraying somebody in a really shitty situation. And the pure desperation in her face over the course of this movie, I totally bought the whole time. And yeah. I will add um, Suzanne Lothar, who plays the mother, as well as uh, the actor who plays the father, uh, Ulrich Mew, um, and Arno Frisch, who plays Paul, uh, one of the, the creepy young sinister men, and also Frank Gehring, who plays Peter, his, uh, his partner. Uh, they're all kind of uh, Haneke, uh, Michael or Michael Haneke regulars. They appeared in, um, uh, in different variations in... Uh, Benny's video and uh, uh, also the white ribbon, I believe. And oh, also wow. his adaptation of Kafka's the castle, which I think was a TV movie in Germany, but I would highly recommend, I think criterion did a, also did a, a treatment of that. Um, and it's also like one of the best Kafka adaptations for anyone that is into Kafka. Yeah. And this actor Ulrich Muhe, I'm sorry, the last name is totally off, but he was also in a movie called The Lives of Others, which is pretty oh, wow. prominent. And I still need to check it out personally, but I've heard that movie is is, is fantastic. Yeah, it's an well. Academy Award winning film for foreign language film at the time. And it's certainly one of the more acclaimed films to have come out this century. Yeah. Also, Suzanne we... Lothar and Ulrich Mew were married in real life, which I think oh, is wow. worth... Uh, That's worth what marrying. I was about to say. These... This couple in this movie was an actual married couple in real life, the two actors, which yeah. I think kind of came through, honestly, during this yeah. horrific situation. It certainly right? felt like it. I didn't, I was not, some point in this film, I was not convinced that it was acting. I thought it was all real. Like, I believed that they were, whether you like this or not, like, I believed these, these two sadists were tormenting this poor couple. Yeah, because there was a scene even where uh, Suzanne's character essentially is all all tied up and her husband is getting profusely stabbed by one of the assailants. And Haneke sh chooses to stay on her and yeah. her reaction only to that experience. And my God, it was it was effective. That's was a lot of effective. why Mikhail Hanukkah's films are so chilling is not because of what they show in particular, but the fact that he almost like asks you to look away at some of the sites and he, he used similar techniques in the piano teacher where during a pretty horrific moment towards the end, um, all you see of Isabel Huppert's character is her face during the sequence. And there is also a, one of the more chilling moments in the film is when Suzanne's character is forced to strip in front of the sadists and her husband with, with their child covered in in a pillow case, which is the the iconic image of the sack over his head that's on the Blu-ray cover, if you if you've seen that, but it's that whole scene is shot mostly in close-ups and there's no violence or nudity even shown. It's all from the shoulders up, and there's no male gaze here. It feels so like natural and like. It, he, I think Hanukkah, Hanukkah deep down is, he's been accused of being like an overly disturbing filmmaker, but I feel like he's, if anything, sensitizing us to the horrific moments that we, that unfold. I he's also not think trying it, to sensationalize anything. Yeah, Lucas, what did you think of the fact that also one of the assailants looks into the camera sometimes and is talking the to the ball. audience? What did you, did you like that part? Well, I mean, that's, I think, like a whole other topic because a lot of people knock this movie, I think. Um, it got a lot of heat when it first premiered, as, as I read it. Yeah, yeah at, uh, Jacques at Rivet Cannes. hated it. Yeah. And said it was a piece of shit and was awful when it first premiered at Cannes. Not surprised, although, honestly, if your movie got that reaction at Cannes, you definitely you pushed a few buttons. You affected some audiences. Absolutely. And I think this this movie also popularized popularized the term trauma porn because I think some reviews torture accused torture porn. Yeah, because the, it's clear this movie is very violent and traumatic. Yeah, I feel like I, less so than, say, Hostel or the later films that are like actually torture porn. 
Yeah. Uh, I think like also people seem to be kind of aggravated that even past the violence, because I found like, this is only my second time watching the movie, but it really isn't all that like overtly explicitly violent. Like I, I was surprised yeah. at how many times it would like cut away when the actual thing would happen, except yeah. for later on when she, uh, when the mother shoots the, uh, one of the guys but not really um, but not really yeah we can get into that but um uh, people were like frustrated because the the movie seemed like actively kind of didactic and preachy and like snooty kind of looking down at the audience like oh so you like violence you like all this like you want it to keep going and i've seen an interview with uh haneke where he talks about like the two assailants and the family are acting in like totally different movies. Like the assailants are in like a, a farce basically yeah. like they're playing stereotypes. They're Tom and Jerry. They are not even remotely in the same situation as the family. Who's like, it's like a brutal realism. Um, and they, they can't be sympathetic whatsoever to the, the situation they're putting the family in. Um, and the third wall breaking gets into that. I, I, I think people really did not like this because they felt like they were being uh, talked down to. And it, that's why I find this movie so interesting because it almost seems to like hate movies and hate moviegoers. Yeah, it's, in a kind way. Of, it's kind of making fun of the audience for like kind of wanting to see what's happening next yeah. and what, what the killers are going to do next. And kind of almost in one case, one of the assailants quite literally winks at the audience, which is the, the kind of on the nose clue into that. Yeah. And I think Haneke too is also playing games with the audience as a director because he knows like how to manipulate you so well, where he's able to have a character look into camera and it not take you out of the movie. Like, in fact, it freaked me out. I watched this with uh, my girlfriend and she looked at Great me. Great date was, movie. Perfect date movie, yeah. Horrible Perfect. date movie, guys. I would not recommend it, but she was freaked out when they were looking into camera. And I think that's a tough directorial thing to achieve. Yeah, the uh, the last lingering shot especially really bothered me the first time I watched it. Like, yeah. I almost want to just turn it off, but I, I forced myself to kind of sit yeah, there and I stare even, into this guy's eyes. For yeah, I, I honestly... Straight. I honestly even thought there was something wrong with my TV when that happened. I, <laughs> yeah. As soon as he like turns into camera and so ends on a very bizarre, but not cheap, but very the opposite of cheesy freeze frame as this heavy metal song that the, that the assailants like plays. And I was like, wait, what's going on? There are no credits showing up. What's happening. And, and it's it the same song jarring. too as the as the intro song, which in the opening credits. I have to tell you, like I also thought, like Jesus, am I? Is my soundtrack okay here? Is this is this normal? Because it is so bold and it is so almost overtly to the senses, right? Which I think this movie, like in a nutshell, is just like we're gonna pummel this family through this event, and we're gonna play with you because you're gonna be invested. Even though you know nothing about them, you don't know why they're at this vacation home. You don't I mean, know why these people are attacking them, really. You just know like they're kind of crazy neighbors. So, yeah, I think it was, it was just Henneke playing games with us, too. It's, like, so deceptively simple in its premise. Like, when I first heard about the film, like, I like, going into this film, I knew the basic plot. But how it's it's more so like how it is about that. Like I was expecting like, oh, this is going to be an unsettling psychological thriller where where two two sadists kidnap and torture a family. Like I we've seen that before, but we haven't seen it the way Hanukkah does it. Because so many I feel like part of what makes the film so unsettling to watch is that he kind of forces us to 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 watch as a lot of the stuff happens because he is and i love when directors do this not enough hollywood filmmakers do this i notice it more in european and asian films as well as in in america kubrick was famous for doing this but he lingers he's willing to linger on scenes for minutes on end and with fairly wide shots with exceptions he did this in piano teacher as well so he is 
he has an established style that carried on to that picture and it makes the scene all the more gripping and all the more like kind of disquieting to watch yeah i guess we can on that note talk about the uh i believe it's like a 10 minute long single yeah, 10 tape. minutes yes and first of all like it this is one of the most horrific scenes i've seen put to film period because a movie any movie has some serious nerve to actually do this um there's an off-screen child murder and it's it's off screen all you see is first of all as as one of the assailants i think it's i think it's paul is getting food is sent to get food once um peter has has the the husband shot in the leg and the kid's head blown off there's a lot of eating in this movie eat. yes um don't, don't this is to say watch it on empty stomach but Right Maybe after, alone too. Yeah, guys. Yeah. Right <laughs> after that, as that happens, we cut to a close up of a TV screen playing a a, a, a racing show with bl blood and brain spattered all over it. And immediately after that, we cut to a staggering ten minute long take, completely wide. We feel like we are. We feel like I felt like I had witnessed this actually happening in front of my eyes in slow motion when the 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 wife the mother is just sitting there staggering at what has just occurred and is like at and even like pauses for minutes on end just to comprehend what has just happened and then only minutes later does she does her does she like start to call her husband and they just cannot they just can't process what has just the happened use, to them. The use of these long takes in this movie grounds you in this absurd situation, I must say. Because you, you're you almost like, how did this escalate to this point where this kid's head is completely blown off by a shotgun? Um, and the reason why it feels real, I think, is because you just stay in these long takes for, like we said, 10 minutes. And you it's brutal. Like, you want to move on. You want to go to the next scene. And Haneke says... No, I'm I'm making you stay here and sit yeah. in the somberness. Mikhail Hanukkah does not want you to have a fun time at the movies and show you like a like a cathartic ending to a thriller. He just wants he cut he more or less like wants you he more or less puts you through an endurance test with some of these moments. And this again is another similarity to the piano teacher. We see like a couple of not quite as many, but like some minutes long takes in that of just isabel Huppert doing something perverse yeah, yeah. lucas i kind of want to ask you like just from like a personal perspective what do you think of the long takes because i know some people that they get tired and they're like can i it's slowing the pace down what do you think though i mean i respect that i i think as like a bona fide sucker for long takes i i Same. really can't get enough of them i i love what it does for actors performances because i think at its at its best it like it brings them back into what they loved about acting which i guess like in most cases was originally like a uh like a theatrical form yeah. of acting um certainly and i yeah i just love the choreography involved i love like the like the real time that it puts you in especially with this movie like i have never felt i don't think like the weight of a a death of a character as much as in that one scene and um and it's it's hard to talk about on the but i yeah i think it's so effective i think his use of them and i haven't seen all of his films but like the ones that i have seen there's always like a really really rich uh series of long takes i would definitely recommend the 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 movie Cache if you guys haven't seen it already it ends with a really long take that goes like into the credit sequence where you don't hear any of the characters talking and it's a sim it's a similar very wide shot of a busy entrance to a school and possibly the most important moment of the narrative of the movie happens in that one long take but you don't get it like you don't deserve it I guess is <laughs> what Haneke's position is but 
I don't know. I, I just really love it. I love how he does it. I think they did three takes of it in funny games of that of that take. And the second oh, one was more. what was used. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And also just kind of pivoting to just our overall interpretations of the film, because I'm not sure if this is 100 percent a movie that you should take literally. I actually think that these two assailants might be workers of the devil and they're in hell right now and everyone's already dead. And the reason why it's such a cyclical pattern by the end of, can I, can I have some eggs please? Is there is this debate of what came first, the chicken or the egg. And Uh. guess what? It might've been some devil workers just, you know, messing around and playing God and they created humans. I'm not sure, but Haneke definitely has some nihilistic perspectives about human life here. Yeah, and especially since we're not, we're, I don't know if we're necessarily, we end up sympathizing with him because of just how horrifying this occurrence is. But I don't know if we're necessarily supposed to love this rich family when we first see them. Because when we see this, like, opening, this great opening scene, one of the most striking opening shots I've seen in a while of the family in, in their car, like, carrying this big old boat behind them very kind of reminiscent of the title sequence of the shining um they and of course they're listening to opera so at first we can assume like uh they're they're kind of snooty but but then we see what's going on what what the assailants end up doing to them it's just hard not to feel sorry for them and might i add is it just me or was there at least a little bit of queer coding in peter and paul oh yeah i think you can definitely uh get into that yeah it um, reminded me of a couple hitchcock films of rope and strange on a train where the oh yeah, two, yeah where the two where the two killers in this case are are like particularly close partners so but if you if you study it more deeply you can find a bit more of a potentially like like gay or queer coded subtext that there may be something a little more between them because there's there are even moments where they like call the call each other names like almost like like tubby yeah that's why i'm like are were they brothers because i think one of the plot points that was brought up in the middle of this you know torturing of this family was that they had a mother that was a drug user yeah right? and, and they know- got a, they got an abused childhood experience that i think it's possible this is my interpretation of the film that they they're they are dead these two guys but they are devils because they had a sh- really really bad childhood upbringing from this mother and now they're in hell playing games with all of their victims yeah it could be it could be if you take it literally it could very well also just be like nature nurture it ends up being nurture because because it, because then for me it explains at the end when tubby one of the assailants is literally talking about is this real is this fiction is the universe supposed to happen like and this? They even they even rewind the one like expectation that we would have from any thriller, which is the cathartic moment where where the the kidnapped woman es- shoots the shoots the killer and escapes. Which yeah, we, Lucas, what did you think of that part when and he flips it uh, on its head? Shotgun kills Tubby, and then one of the assailants rewinds it back and is like, "Nope, that didn't happen." Yeah, I mean, pretty much this whole movie is like totally anti-catharsis in every sense of the word. Um, Even with like what you were mentioning before about like their backgrounds, um, that was I I was seeing that as like another kind of game they were playing about like, oh, you want this catharsis of knowing like, oh, we come from like a, a poor family. Our mother was like our whole family's full of drug addicts. Like we're not brought up well. We're uh, we're taking it out on the rich and, and wealthy even and well adjusted. But and yeah, even, it's like yeah, it's just a game. Yeah, even then, um, Tubby ends up getting tormented as well, along with the family, because Peter keeps bringing this up during one of these torture sessions, and he even makes him cry at one point. So it feels like Peter may be the one even more in control here so he could very well he he very well could be like the devil in charge yeah like in charge of the movie itself it's which is super unsettling of he's course the one but... who's they kind clearly of manipulating have God, the audience they clearly yeah. have godlike powers and 
I also want to mention that they are wearing white the entire film, barely yeah. get a speck of blood on them, and wear white gloves the whole movie too. So yeah, I, I noticed that. I noticed that right away because it was a already kind of a subversion of like the the black and white good and evil trope in like kind of psychology, but this time like the the white that we see is is not pleasant. It's it's evil, and also those shorts. Oh, the shortest no. ever. Yeah. I, I was wondering if that's kind of the costume design for them was supposed to kind of um, have them camouflage in this kind of like social strata, like this bourgeois, like, you know, cottage community. I think that might have been part of it. I, I also wanted to ask if because this always confused me about the setup of the movie was like you first meet Paul in like in on the lawn of their their neighbor's cottage. And it's like far off in the distance. And clearly their neighbor friend is like, he knows Paul's deal and he's afraid of him. And when the neighbor brings Paul to their house, it's so uncomfortable and strange. But like, what what would, what do you make of that? Like, did, did Paul and Peter like threaten them? And like, they clearly didn't go as far as they did with the neighbors. And they've, they're doing like a circle around this, this area, it seems like. But I mean, maybe it's not meant to be known, but like, what do you think like Paul would have said to the neighbor? Like he just wanted to get at this specific family? I think it was more like, I think the crazy part about when karmic justice is served in real life and in movies and in books is that it comes randomly and sometimes you there's no explanation for it yeah so i think in that case it was merely like the family had eggs to give those kids and one family didn't and look what happens when that well that one family did have eggs though that's the thing but that family i guess just had bad luck at the end of the day yeah and and plus right when you meet um peter and paul like first of all there's that that really great moment of them in front of the gates just standing like statues and then there's a particularly striking moment another like minutes long take of just i think it's it's of peter just just like trying to talk to the talk to the mother and ending up spilling a bunch of stuff on her and in that moment that moment particularly struck me in terms of this actor's performance because he very much struck me as a Norman Bates type. At least that's what he was trying to put, put himself out there as this like seemingly mild mannered, but deep down sinister personality. I just adore that first egg borrowing scene, by the way. I, I think like, especially Suzanne Lothar in that one scene. I mean, we were talking about like how we sympathize with the main family too, like whether we are supposed to, I, I mean, we are, but especially at the beginning, I, I find it so funny, just like the pace at which he starts to kind of like lose patience with this guy. Yeah. Like when she, when he drops like the phone um, in the water and like, he keeps asking for eggs. Like if it was, if and this was not a, like a psychopath, like I would have still, you know, been, she was clearly like done with this guy, like soon on, maybe she had this like, you know, supernatural suspicion of like, or a premonition of what would happen. But um... even as a viewer, too, when he was bumbling around, like dropping phones in water, I knew I knew that this was all on purpose. Yeah. And this family is going to be absolutely screwed because I walked into this movie, Lucas, not knowing a not knowing a thing about it. That's and the way to do by, it. And by the end of it, it gave me such a ride and a thrill because I didn't know where I was going to go. Yeah. But also just really effectively done. I want to ask. You guys, what is your letterbox score for this movie? Um, for me, it's a four and a half, potentially it, on a rewatch, potentially a five. I don't know why I'd want to do that to myself, but still, th this was an excellent picture. It was, I think I, it, I'm between that and Piano Teacher. I think I like Piano Teacher just a little more, probably because it was my intro to Haneke and it gave me one of my all time favorite performances in Isabel Huppert, but. But this is this is up there. Yeah, I actually do not score things on Letterboxd. Yeah, I noticed. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Respect. Or maybe I have like at the very start, but like I find it so hard to standardize everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess for you, Lucas, if you don't want to score it, where would you rank this for his other work, Haneke? I mean, I would uh, agree with Connor. I, I, I love Piano Teacher. I think I like that one more. Um, uh, I'm not sure where it goes in terms of everything. I've seen most of his movies. Um, I, I maybe, oof. Yeah, yeah it might admit, be like Piano can... Teacher, Caché, and then Funny Games. Yeah, I also confess, like I've just seen this and uh, Piano Teacher, so yeah. I'm a bit of a newbie to Haneke's work. By the way, off topic, but what thoughts on the 2007 English language, more or less shot for shot remake? Because I I haven't watched it, but I ha already have mixed feelings about it. Yeah, and for for context for the audience, essentially what happened is in 2007, Michael Haneke made a shot for shot recreation of this entire movie with Naomi Watts as the main lead and actress. Raw. And, and it, it didn't do particularly well with critics because it, it lacked originality and well, yeah. it, it lost money. It lost about $8 million at the box office. So. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if this is really a commercial film though. So I don't, I don't know if that's a big L, but, but it, from what I recall, it, it has been, I think watched a bit more than the original, probably because it was, it, first of all, it's in English, so more accessibility for um, American audiences. But I feel like even if the film itself isn't too badly done, I mean, I I'm sure the the performances are very good. I I just if if I were you, I'd probably just stick with the original and just read the subtitles. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I would definitely give a PSA to avoid the 2007 remake. Um, because I, I heard I think, that like people who who haven't seen the original have said it's like very good, but it's the same yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, Twice. I I think because like the intention of the first one was as like a type of, you know, like Trojan horse movie that comments on other movies, especially American like violent American crime thriller movies. So I think like he was attracted to that idea of making the same movie in America with yeah, like. He, largely American actors to be able to reach that target audience that he wanted to like yeah. shit on a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Which I, I have to be straight right up move. though. I as have a matter to be straight up. As a matter of fact though, he actually intended to make the movie in America, but for, oh, really? but for practical reasons, he decided to, to shoot in Austria instead, mm. at, which, which I guess like that, that worked anyhow. Cause it, cause honestly this film like kind of could take place anywhere. It yeah. kind of has that. I love, so I love Naomi already, and Tim Roth, but yeah. I, yeah, I if you already yeah. have a, a a movie that you completed and it got decent reviews from certain audiences, right? It, it's not like it's a critically panned movie. Yeah, it's not like Psycho. I don't see I don't see the proper reasoning to redo the movie if it's already decent enough. If and it ain't broke, when, don't yeah. fix it. When we say shot for shot, it is literally shot for shot. Like it is the same thing, the just in English, movie. with this, with just with different actors. Yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, I just want to say this: my letterbox review for this movie was a four and a half out of five, which means mm -hmm. I highly recommend this movie to anybody into disturbing psychological thrillers. Honestly, yeah, I would say his earlier ones are even more disturbing. Like Benny's video really, really disturbed me. And it has the same uh, actor uh, or Paul Arno Frisch is like the mm -hmm. main kid in Benny's video. And that one is to me even worse. Yeah, I, wow. I was pretty I was pretty chilled by both movies, both Piano Teacher and this. Yeah. I guess a little more this because it has like more of the horror elements and it has mm -hmm. violence in it. But whereas Piano Teacher is a little more like emotionally draining of a of an experience and certainly like more sexually perverse than this one so both both are both are good if you want to put yourself through that yeah and go get the criterion channel hard physical media disc for this because criterion is doing god's work when it comes to yeah. restoring and, and keeping films alive and if you can't afford that like by all means get subscribe to the criterion channel that's yes. how i actually watched this it is probably the best streaming service out. This Absolutely day the best value, I think, no matter what. Yeah, it's only um, it's only ten it's only eleven bucks a month. 
Yeah, Not for bad. movies that you literally can't find anywhere else. And if you could no. find them, they would cost you about 40 bucks. Um, but yeah, Funny Games is one of those that's like perpetually on the Criterion channel. I haven't seen it not on yeah. there. It's it's, it's not like good. A, it's yeah. it's not leaving anytime soon. So go check it out. It's also on HBO Max if you don't have Criterion channel. So perhaps the more accessible option. Um, this is an excellent film. If you're willing, if you're willing to stomach this, then definitely go watch it. Also, Just, if you're a if you're a golf fan, maybe avoid this one. Yeah. Yeah, not 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 a terrible what statement, is, honestly. That's what this is. <laughs> anyway, that's gonna lead us to our next Criterion movie, which was Connor and I's pick for yeah. today's video, and that's gonna be Daddy Long Legs, yeah, which is more. the feature length debut for the Safty Bros. Actually, it's second? not their feature. Their yeah. second movie after a pleasure of of being robbed, but their first, I think. To like get a lot of almost attention. not, yeah. I I have to go by doing the interview, the overview, but I'll also probably twinkle in a couple of Safety Bro facts that I know because why not, right? Love yeah. It. So this this movie is released in two thousand nine, and it stars Ronald Bronstein as the lead character, who plays one of the worst on screen fathers probably of all time, yeah. uh, in terms <laughs> of the fact that he is just not responsible. No, he is a worker at a projectionist and he's a projectionist in New York that is divorced. And when he has to deal with dual custody with his children, he does not know how to take care of them he at all fit for it to the point where he is literally drugging his kids and he drugs them too much. They fall asleep for a week and he'll just come home on the fourth day of work and be like, you, you up, you up. And they're just passed. They're just, passed yeah, out. he doesn't even go there. home. He like calls <laughs> his apartment to see if they're awake. Like he's not even home, but we can just get yeah. the worst dad. And Debbie this dad movie cool. sprouted out because the Safdie brothers became friends with Bronstein after a film festival where he released Frownland, which is also another criterion movie. And they essentially went up to him and said, we think you could play a version of our father that is also, this is a very personal, personal movie because I think the twin brothers in the movie are actually the Safdie bros. I'm just going to go out and say it. And the oh, father yeah, figure in this movie is definitely, definitely, if not heavily inspired by their own father who, you know, was a, you know, he ended up divorcing a real D. their mother. And not not a real D, but like he had like other things in his life. I'm pretty sure he yeah. was an architecturalist in New York. So I, I like just he was wish juggling he his job. Yeah, just hope. Just I just hope they didn't get drugged. Yeah, uh, I, it's possible because that's such a quirky situation to have. Yeah, but it's... did they ever address that? Like, if that's a real story, I think they've been asked, but they probably just shy away from answering because that's just like I don't want to throw my dad under yeah, the bus here. Yeah, it is here. such a personal work of theirs, and such a like Fair, a sometimes yeah. a, an often quite funny, but sometimes pretty uncomfortable work. It it almost reminded me of it definitely reminded me of Funny Pages, a picture that they produced later, a very good film directed by Owen Klein, and it has a similar tone to that. Although when I first saw the film, I when I first watched it, I was like, this is a Safety Brothers movie. I was kind of surprised having only seen their more recent, more well-known stuff like Good Time, Anka Jams. Yeah, and this is clearly not quite as exciting as those. Exactly. Very, very chill watch at times. It gets a little kind dicey because of... Yeah, the father, the father figure character whose name I will is Lenny. The character's name is Lenny. Yeah. He so cyber, might I add so. is just is just so tunnel vision in his world that he is to the point of not just disregarding children, but disregarding even friends and family. Right? Yeah, even even homeless guys. Yeah, Lucas, what do you what I do mean, you think of this movie? Just overall, I loved this movie. I really, really love this movie. Um, and you're right. Like if you're looking for kind of like a pulsing, just like, I don't know, cardiac arrest inducing thriller, crime thriller. You're probably not going to get it. No, you're not going to get it here. There, I was also surprised just because there's like moments of just like real like tenderness. There's just like cuteness yeah. a lot of the time. And I know like, 
we open saying he's probably the worst father ever. Yeah, but it's like but, kind of a warm movie, surprisingly. Yeah, for he Sap- is like, I never thought I'd say that about a Sappy Brothers movie. Yes. And uh, he's got two weeks with these kids, right? Like, and most of the rest of the year, they're with their their mom. Um, so he's really just trying to, like, be like a fun machine, like constantly instilling kind of memories in these kids that they won't forget about him. Yeah, he's like, now, now I'm the fun dad. Now yeah. I'm divorced. Yeah, but that boundary between fun and, like, angry Dangerous. is always, yeah. It's because he's yeah. clearly just irritated from work and, like, even just the responsibility of picking these kids up from school for two weeks out of the year. It's is, like it's an inconvenience crazy. for him. Yeah. He, he, yeah. We I even, was just going to, yeah, I was just going to say such a powerful opening too of him, you know, eating a hot dog in Central Park, jumping a fence. Two hot dogs in one bun. horribly and then proceeds to, you know, have the hot dog hit the grass and like all yeah. on the floor and he picks it up Mood. and starts eating it again and laughing to himself. No. Don't what a it. great way to introduce Lenny to us as an audience, yeah. because that's just a sliver of how chaotic this guy is. And he asked for a foot long. Yeah. <laughs> Why? But they could not accommodate that. Yeah. I also thought it was really interesting, too, that the Safdie brothers actually found these two kids on the street, apparently. And we're like, do you want to act in this movie? They are incredible wow. child actors. And Credit to everybody in this movie because I know this budget is not super big, and it's shot on sixteen millimeter film, which like yeah, it, I don't think it, is it's a commonly used practice. Looking. Very grungy looking. Yeah. It's what do like you think shot- of the visual aesthetic, Lucas? Did it work for you? Oh, definitely, and I think that's like one of the like Touchstone Safety Brother, uh, yeah, like aesthetic choices. Like that was one of the only things I was clinging to as like a familiar uh like element to this movie as a safety brothers movie was like yeah like the actual use of film stock and everything like that and like the handheld neorealist style yeah um, I, it kind of reminded me of a sean baker early sean baker movie takeout which i actually got to see in a class on new york and film last semester um another solid film i'd recommend if you're into the new york independent scene um, fairly similar in style to this one, a little, a little more hectic with, with the pacing in terms of, because it's about a, uh, uh, delivery boy for a Chinese takeout restaurant who has to constantly rush to get food delivered and to angry customers. So I felt like it was, it honestly it felt kind of daddy long legs felt kind of more in line with stuff like that than the Safdie's later works, which kind of goes to show like how they have stylistically evolved from, from this. Yes. You can definitely also see the, uh, like Cassavetes influence. Yes. Um, a lot of people drop Cassavetes as like a big, uh, name or inspiration for them, but you cannot see a trace of it. And like in a lot of the people that will name him, but, with the Safties, like that is absolutely the case, especially yeah, Daddy Longlegs, because they more because Cassavetes more or less invented the sort of the neorealist American independent film sort of slice of life kind of n- not much plot sort of style, and yeah. a lot of it can be owed to that. And I think too, just such a good early impression of their character writing. Because I have to be honest, I saw the pleasure of being robbed. And I don't really understand some of the plot points and some of the characters in that movie. But in this one, every single character, I think, had a purpose and was was acting their, you know, their tails off mixed with just good casting. I just I love the Safdie brothers, guys. I think they're fantastic filmmakers. And this is one of the first ones where I was like, there we go. This Definitely, is the style. Certainly among the more like interesting, stylistic, those like visionary directors to come out of the modern american independent like a24 scene even though they were veterans of the new york independent and thankfully they have gotten a wider audience with with good time and uncut gems also is it just me or did it seem like these kids just had the greatest time filming this movie or maybe they're just the best actors and they're put in like a great situation but like it, it just seemed like a ball 
I honestly, re- I I was listening to an interview, which is on the Criterion disc about this movie, and essentially the mother of the two of one of the children was telling uh Benny Safdie that it was a little bit tough for them because they couldn't distinct Lenny from Ronald, the actor. They they thought Lenny and Ronald were almost the same person at points wow. because the character was written for Ronald. And so, like, they did have fun, but I think it was complicated for them shooting because it felt so real. Yeah, that yeah, must definitely... always be an issue, especially, like, with uh, child actors in, like, sitcoms or something where people are playing their parents for, yeah. you know, so many hours of a week. Like, and, that uh, will confuse Yeah, and I'm, and I'm a child of divorced parents myself, and I there were moments of this that, like, hit fairly close, even though I'm probably there, I'm in different circumstances than than Lenny in this film. Yeah, and I also just to mention, like, just a fun fact: the interview between Benny and Josh Safdie that I listened to, they also mentioned that this movie, they always look back to this one as kind of their motivational movie in terms of they're always looking to get a bigger paper pile that can be you know sprayed across the floor because. There's a scene in this movie where essentially a bunch of paper falls on the floor and wind, you know, spirals it all over the place. And essentially how they filmed this was with leaf blowers and like four guys just like tossing paper. And it's so run and gun like that they said now all they think about is how can they make a bigger one of those scenes. And I'm like, that's such a yeah, good they're probably, mentality. They're, to they're, have. Probably, they're probably going to do like Inception where it's where they literally have it blowing everywhere out of all the windows. Yeah. and. And plus the 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 paper itself ends up being this this very child seemingly childish cartoon that they drew of 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 Lenny pissing in his boss's drink based on a true story. <laughs> so that kind of gives you a little bit of perverse background into this character. Yeah, and I I also want to ask Lucas, what did you think of the mosquito sequence in this movie? Because I think that was probably the most trippy part of this very down to earth picture. Yeah, I mean, I was first of all not expecting like a a sweet family comedy drama from the Safties, and I certainly was not expecting like a Safty surrealism to come and up out of nowhere. Literally, Daddy Long Legs shows up. Yes. Like, I never would have thought that they were interested in dream sequences, honestly. I thought they were so completely dedicated to this uh, this neorealism or whatever they want to call it. Although there, um, there are, like, hints of it, at, especially in the opening of Uncut Gems, where you quite literally get a, an acid dream sequence through a colonoscopy. Right, right, right. So there is a bit of like hint of that, like Safdie brothers sur- sense of surrealism, although it is kind I of, think it, I think it in. always is like, there's a little bit of surrealism in their movies, but for the most part, their hyper realism is what kind of makes a Safdie brothers movie. So anxiety inducing, Yeah, right? and partly... but they'll toss in a little trippiness. Like I remember in good time, even some of those neon colors were hitting in that playhouse area. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the uh like the creature work on that mosquito like is very like Cronenberg like even like a racer yeah, was, head sort I was kind of, of like surprised that they could do that on the tiny budget yeah like the although, like blood sack kind of like although thing I, and everything. although I guess yeah. I can kind of understand because they shoot it mostly in close up so as to hide some of the effects yeah work. but it yeah but it's I'd still, I'd like, recommend actually if you're tank. interested in that watching uh it's literally Josh holding like this mosquito they made and he's just filming it and his brother's holding the camera it's sick to watch cuz i'm like wow <laughs> that came out so much better than it looks how you filmed it i also like the division of labor that i i've heard i mean like it's in the credits anyway but that you know like Josh works as basically like a dp or like a co dp and like Benny Safty works the boom mic and i think that's really sweet cuz you know like Benny he said in interviews that like, I, I love working audio and doing the boom mic. Cause like you're right there in the action. And like, yeah. if there's any kind of notes to be given, like you're, you're just in it already. And like, you're literally listening on headphones, like every inch of dialogue, everything. So I, I like how they are totally invested and hands-on. And, and even in the really little, cool. 
even like the seemingly little sections of filmmaking that you see at way, 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 way down the credits. But that's how that's that's guerrilla filmmaking in of itself. Right. They probably first of all they pro they they couldn't have had permits to shoot any of this, especially as they go into the museum. I was like, I don't know, I don't even know how they were able to get in there. I even think the reason why the characters are projectionists is because they were able to shoot in the projection studio where yeah. Ronald Bronstein worked. So they were they were literally figuring oh, out okay. ways how can we sh how can we shoot this and not get sued? After yeah, it's almost like it's almost like how they did Clerks, how they just like had the convenience store available, so they so Kevin Smith just had to shoot there, and he was like, might as well with 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 no, no money whatsoever. And and with the low budget, that's probably why they a lot of the times throughout the film, like a lot of the film clips, as far as I can tell, are in the public domain. So you see like some of the old cartoons, so you wouldn't have had to pay for that. And I think because they are able to jump in as a boom operator, as an actor, as a director, it gives their movies a certain energy that I think is hard to replicate. Yeah, that's they're, 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 they're almost making these movies like... One, it's going to be their last one, and two, if I don't hold this boom mic here, we're not getting sound. And I think it equates to just more effective, energy-inducing filmmaking. Yeah, right. it certainly, it certainly like feels like it's it. They definitely like feel energetic compared to other, certainly like a lot of other low-budget filmmakers who are oftentimes like more willing to do like sort of a quiet drama, like a like a quiet sort of mumblecore movie that takes place mostly in people's bedrooms. But like Safdie's definitely not to sh not to not to put any anybody making those under the bus, but Safdie's definitely have a bit of ambition t to them, like even in their earlier works. Yeah, I kind of want to go into this. Was there any flaws with this movie? Because I could see some people having issues maybe with this protagonist is sometimes very unlikable. Yeah, right? he's yeah. Um, I feel like there were a couple of not to mostly nitpicks but mostly like with some technical issues with the filmmaking which do come with a smaller budget and there there were even some parts during some of these pretty admittedly pretty shaky shots where there were issues with the rack focus not to mm. not to throw not to throw you under the bus but but um you you what you went on to better things i think i think to that point too it was tough to f to get all of it in focus at times yeah, because definitely. the camera does kind of move around and is handheld for a lot of this movie yeah it's handheld i it didn't it usually that bothers me in a lot of especially student films that i've seen and other independent films it didn't quite bother me here because they went with just head first into neorealism whereas a lot of other films i've seen that use handheld use it too much to the point where it's kind of First of all, like unnecessarily headache inducing. And second of all, it makes it look and feel kind of pretentious and mumble corey. And I, I think here, though, it, it doesn't it do works that here because it, it fits the aesthetic of the movie, the tone of the movie. This character is essentially an insect in New York City, right? Daddy long legs, right? So yeah, so I think I think it's kind of fit. flying around. I think it fit. What did you think, Lucas? No, I I thought it it works really well. I would be interested to see the Criterion release of it. I, I unfortunately did not see, um, because they just like newly yeah uh, it was I think it was restored it released it was it. just like late last year that they put it out. So it was, yeah, I think they put that and Frownland out at roughly the same time. So they're they're starting to pick up some of the the New York indie films from that time and from filmmakers who have since since gone to to make it as big as the safties and might i add there's actually early on in the film there's actually a cameo appearance from uh abel ferrara veteran independent filmmaker from new york who is quite a pioneer of that scene he he was given a brief role as as this old guy who who's robbing um who's robbing lenny basically pretending to be a record salesman going like hey do you want some bill with us <laughs> What? Yeah, and it, what a flex too to put Abel Ferreira as a side character in your movie because Bad Lieutenant. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but it's quite a movie with Harvey Keitel. Yeah, he was he was 
that, that that was a nice little nod to him because he also did he did a bunch more stuff he did um he did the addiction the funeral a Miz 45 he was king of new york is probably his most like well-known so he they definitely like paid a bit of homage to one of the sort of pioneers of that scene definitely well, on that note, I just want to say that my letterbox review for Daddy Longlegs was also a four and a half. Granted, I am a little a bit half, I, think. I am a little bit biased. I love like realistic movies that are kind of heartwarming weirdly at times. And I thought this movie did it quite well for the low, low budget that it had. Yeah, for me it's a four. It's a four. Solid. I thought you gave it a three and a half. I think I think I I might have gave it, but then I I, I rewatched it. It it did get better, I must admit. Because it better, yeah. Because I I watched it when I was like two years ago when I was younger, and I don't know. I think I aged more, so the movie probably is just more my type. Because I I can see like a young kid watching this and being like, I just watched a dad mess around for two hours and and and, not really get repercussions for it. Yeah, and you and you also see him very naked at the beginning of the film. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I had trouble too as a, as a as a younger person watching it to understand the the importance of this movie because I wasn't thinking like oh these filmmakers have a father that they're riffing off this story I was just like I I just watched a dad mess around I I didn't get the nuance part of it yeah I think that- I would have really appreciated this when I was a bit younger at least kind of like late middle school era because at the time I was into the kind of like super shaky handheld dramas like half Nelson and fish tank and that kind of thing. So this would have come in handy back then, but even now I, I, but I I do agree. I I probably would not have picked up on a lot of the, like the little details and nuances. Yeah. The emotional stakes. And I think too, there is a slight disconnect for me just on the basis of, I don't, I'm not a child of divorced parents. So this lens is, it's fascinating to look at, but it's not something I can totally, you know, devote myself completely and utterly relate to yeah so i relate I, to it i think i relate to it a little more because mm. because i have had like some of that experience yeah no that that definitely makes sense i just want to say thanks to lucas for hopping on this podcast and just you know dealing with me and connor trying to i know it's tough sometimes to you know hop on and say something and you did an awesome job today dude that was a lot of fun uh you guys do a great job, you know. You gotta. I think you should start some wars with other film review podcasts. Honestly, I, I think we gotta Ooh. start some some beef. Start some oh, start some Drama. beef. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. We gonna are we gonna be like Ali Wong and Stephen Yun and start some beef, dude? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would Not. suggest you know, hearkening back to the the glory days of radio, start like a prank call segment where you call other film reviewers and I don't know, basically just tell them their takes are mid. Um, <laughs> and at best mid at best yeah so i I would suggest something like that but otherwise you guys are doing amazing work um yeah and it was it was a lot of fun no it means a lot lucas and i know you're a listener too so you know just i really respect you hopping on and it's not easy going on a podcast have you ever done that before no first time first time long time i don't know if that even applies but yeah no absolute absolute stud today so i just want to say thanks for everyone too making it this far into this podcast we want to let you know that you can go on tiktok instagram we're all over the place and please go please go follow and subscribe if you're into movies if you want movie discussions if that's your thing please go to subscribe anyway thanks for listening to us and see you next time on before showtime with connor and marcello (laughs) 